Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience and for sticking around. I know we're having some technical difficulties, but what is a virtual conference without a technical difficulty, right? So I'm going to get started. I'm going to be talking about unified API with GraphQL. And in this talk, I will be talking about how to create a unified experience that surfaces a GraphQL endpoint that can be developed selectively by combining two or more downstream APIs. And these APIs can be REST or GraphQL or even a database. So first, a little bit of introduction about me. I'm Shruti Kapoor. I am a senior software engineer at PayPal. Um, and I love building user experiences with React and GraphQL that solve technical problems and make financial lives of people easier at PayPal. Um, if there's anything else that I like more than React and GraphQL and JavaScript, it is deaf jokes. So I'm gonna be asking you questions. And if you can see the chat, reply hi. So I know you are there. And I'm gonna open my chat here. Hello, Pamela. Hi, Sunny and Zachary. All right, so I'm gonna ask you questions and you can say the answer in chat. And before the question, I have a hint for you. Go check out Twitter at ShruddhiKapoor08 if you need answers. So the first question, how are computers and AC similar? And I'll give you like maybe five minutes, five seconds to answer. You can put the answer in the chat, whatever you think. So how are computers and AC similar? Both break when you need them most. Oh, well, I'm so sorry for you, Sunny. Both run cold, both have a fan. That, that's true. Anybody else? You could also check Twitter. They're both useless when you open windows. <laughs> okay, next one. Why did the JavaScript developer leave? Why did the JavaScript developer leave? Any ideas? Because they didn't get a raise. Okay, next question. What does a programmer inherit? Class? Oh, nice. I like that. What else? Tech debt, that's correct. <laughs> you are the winner. Um, I don't know how to say your name. Kajama S. Rura Masrur. All right, you are the winner. Okay, so if you're interested in more dev jokes, you can go to GitHub repository, shrutikapur 8 slash dev joke. Or you can also follow me on Twitter, where I also tweet JavaScript tips um, in addition to dev jokes. But let's get started today. So I'm going to be talking about unified API. And the talk is mainly going to be divided into three main topics. I'll talk about what is a unified API, why unified API with GraphQL, and then I'll show you a demo of how to build a unified API uh, using Hasura, and I'll combine a REST API and a GraphQL API. So what is a unified API and why this concept? 
So this concept actually came to my mind on a very typical Saturday during the pandemic. Um, when on a typical Saturday, how we spend it these days is by going grocery shopping. So I was supposed to go grocery shopping and all the items that we need are things like food, clothes, video games, some electrical supplies, bedding, stationary supplies, home decor, and beauty supplies. Um, now, each of those items can be store, can be bought from a different store. So some stores specialize, for example, in food like Trader Joe's, light bulbs like Home Depot, uh, video games like Best Buy, clothes, H&M, uh, beauty supplies, and so on. So in order to buy all of these things, what I'll have to do is I'll have to go to each of those items separately. So first I'll start with Trader Joe's, I'll go to Bed Bath & Beyond, I'll prioritize my list, my grocery shopping list, and then I'll maybe go to Home Depot and go to Office Depot and so on. So if I was to optimize this a little bit, what I could also do is instead of going to all of these items, first going to Trader Joe's and then coming back home and then going to Bed Bath and then coming back home, I could instead go to a parking lot and see what uh, stores are available there and go check out those stores. So I could optimize my uh, my grocery shopping a little bit but that's still a lot of trips to make and that's basically what working in an enterprise is like every single day we have to interact with so many different apis and sometimes they might be sharing common data so for example um home depot sells light bulbs and sells maybe some stationery but also Office Depot would sell uh, light bulbs and some stationery. So instead of going to Home Depot for uh, light bulbs, why don't I just go to Office Depot and get my light bulbs there plus get my stationery there. So this way, some stores are actually sharing some common data. And that's how our APIs are as well. Some APIs are sharing common data. Some of them may be asking for similar parameters. But then as a client interacting with those APIs, those downstream APIs, I have to read all of their documentation. I have to integrate with all of them separately. Um, and to demonstrate this example a little bit further, let's actually build a fictional cost splitting product. Um, so those of you who are from US may find this familiar. But what we're going to build is kind of a way for us to equally distribute money within friends and charge them for dinner. So this could be a dinner or a trip or, but basically what we want to do is that a user should be able to select a list of their friends and charge them for uh, dinner um, or any cost. A user should be able to select all of their friends from their friends list they should be able to select which payment method they want to support. So it could be credit card or PayPal or Venmo. Um, and if we want to send them remind, we want to send them notifications to all of their friends, either in-app notifications or email reminders. And if the friend is not already a customer of our company, we want to sign them up as a customer. Once the friend has already paid, we want to display a confirmation both to the payee and the payer. So very typical application, very commonly used, something called, uh, like, like Venmo is a, a good example of this. Now, when you're working, when we're working on an enterprise, there's usually multiple APIs that will do part of the job that we want to do. So for example, in this case, we need to fetch a list of friends and we may have at our disposal an API like slash user. We want to fetch a list of payment methods that are eligible for that user. And we may have at our disposal an API slash payments and similarly notifications and sign up. So let's, um, let's talk through how the architecture and the sequence diagram of this will look. So we'll start with the very first one, which is a user can choose to pay with any payment method. Um, in this case, let's talk about some of the APIs that we might be using. So remember we have slash user at our disposal. So what we might have to do is because we want to get all of the payment methods that this user is eligible for, we'll have to call a get API and get all the payment methods. Then we'll have to get, we'll have to make a post call to slash payments to actually pay that API, uh, pay that user. Um, 
when we call POST API, we may have to call, we may have to pass, pass in an auth token and we may have to pass in an auth token even for the get API. We need to use user ID and we may need to pass in user ID for POST as well. And then POST further, uh, POST slash payments further calls downstream payment processing APIs to request funds, which may co be called by payments itself, or we may need to handle that on our own side as well. So that's the first part. Next, the second part is that we need to process the payment from a user. So we need to understand which payment methods are eligible for a user. We will call that API, we'll have a post processing, post payment processing API as well to dispatch the funds. And then similarly for friends, we'll have a get user profile and so on. So to show that in a sequence diagram, it basically looks like this. The client will first integrate with the user's API, pass in a user ID, then that user's API will go call the database and do its downstream stuff. That database comes back to the user's API and then it sends us the information as a client. Now we've got the user profile. So from that, we can also get the payment methods. So we'll call the payment API. Payment API gives back information to us. We'll display that payment methods on our application. And let's say that the user ha wants, has to select a credit card. And now we need to click, uh, let's say that they select PayPal and now we need to show their friends. So we'll call another API, which could be another endpoint on users itself, which will do its downstream things, come back to us with a list of friends. Now that we've got a list of friends from users, we'll have to call another API for notifications, which we'll call the signup API. Maybe we have to call it ourselves, maybe it will call by itself. And then finally we can call the payments API. So if you were counting, that's six different APIs that we have to integrate with. And every single API that we have to integrate with brings new documentation we have to read. Um, there might be different handle, uh, the different errors that might be handled, uh, might need to be handled. They might be uh, thrown in different format because every API might have a different error case. Uh, most of those APIs would be using similar parameters. So they would all be talking about, uh, they will all be using OAuth tokens. They would all need a user ID. Some parameters might be common. Some of them may not be common. We also need to remember our validations, but then all of these APIs might have different versioning as well. So when they do update, we have to keep up with it. That's just a lot of work. That's just too much stuff to care about. What if on a Saturday, instead of going to all these stores differently, I could just go to one store and get all of my stuff from Target. I'm not sponsored by any of these brands, by the way. But similarly, what if in our enterprise, instead of talking to all these six different APIs, I could just talk to one API. I talk to this one interface and I ask them the information and they give me back the information I need and I don't need to worry about any of the downstream complexities or calling users or payments or notifications or whatever. I don't care about all of that. So that is Unified API. So in short, Unified API is an API that provides one interface for you to interact with as a client. And you don't need to worry about any of the downstream APIs at all. So you can only pass in, you pass in the parameters that that interface needs. And that interface takes care of passing in that parameter to all of the downstream APIs. So you are, you're only doing auth one time, that auth token gets carried away all the way to the downstream APIs. And because this is GraphQL, there is one version that you need to worry about. And there is one place you have to look up documentation. And all of the existing uh, enterprise architecture that's built using microservices is still there at your leverage. So that still works independently. So um, just a quick poll, how many of you have worked with uh, GraphQL? If you've worked with GraphQL, say GraphQL, otherwise you can say rest in the chat. So if you've worked with GraphQL, say GraphQL or say rest. Okay, some people have worked with GraphQL, some people have worked with REST, both, both's great. Cool, so it looks like most people have worked with REST. 
So not a problem. I'll give a brief uh, primer on what is GraphQL. I'll just talk about what is the difference between working with GraphQL and working with uh, REST. So if you're unfamiliar with GraphQL, GraphQL is actually an open source software as well. And the definition of GraphQL on the website itself says that it's a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with the existing data, provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API, and it gives the clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. And I think that is what makes GraphQL so powerful, especially for a unified API. So I'll show you how. So let, let me show you how uh, working with the REST would go and how working with GraphQL would go. So let's say that we're building like this uh, play music uh, app. Um, you would call an API endpoint albums and then it further calls multiple API endpoints. And then what happens with REST is that all of those endpoints need to resolve and then your albums endpoint would resolve. And then what happens in the background is that all of these would give different objects. And then finally you'll get a big object back. But with GraphQL, what happens is that you have one endpoint albums and then actually in the background, you'll be calling like a query. So you'll, you'll pass in whatever fields you need up front. So you let the GraphQL API control what, it, what uh, you, you, you will control what fields you want to get back. So here we just need date and name and ID and actor. So you send those objects over to the GraphQL API. It goes and does its thing and gives you back one object. So not that multiple APIs will be giving back their object to you, it'll just be giving back one object and that's exactly all the fields that you asked for and nothing extra. So that's why it's really helpful in making this unified API because it reduced the amount of data that you kind of have to capture on your client side. So that's a primer between GraphQL and REST. Um, I'll give, I'll hop into the demo part of this um, so for this demo, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a unified API. I will have a REST API with it, and I'll have a GraphQL API with it. And this GraphQL API can be authenticated as well. Same with REST, it can be authenticated as well or unauthenticated. For the purpose of this demo, I'll be showing you how a authenticated API works. So let's get right into it. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, and just for just as an FII, all the tools that I'll be using will be GraphQL, Hasura, and Netlify for this demo. So the first thing I'm going to do is open my Hasura cloud here. I have Hasura running uh, uh, in my cloud, so I'll launch this console. And here, when you see, you will see that I have. So this is the Hasura's uh, graphical interface. Um, on the left here, these are the queries that are available to me. And by queries, these are actually REST API endpoints that are available to me. I'll show you the code in a little bit, but basically um, what we want to do is, if you guys are familiar with dev.2, it's actually a platform for uh, sharing blogs. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. So what we want to do is for a user, we want to show what blogs that they have written uh, and what articles they have written. So for that, we'll look into this API and I'm on their developer documentation website. And it looks like here, there's a, uh, there is a uh, published articles get interface. So that's the one that we need. So here uh, we can see here, if we come down, I think the fields that we'll use are description, title, um, and maybe public reactions count. So, I've got a curly, I've got a HTTP endpoint here. I'm just gonna copy this and I'll show you the code. So in the code, I think I have the code right here. All right, uh, you guys can still see my screen, right? Awesome, thank you. All right, so in the code, what we're gonna do is we need this endpoint and we are going to create a simple fetch function. So I've got my API endpoint here, I've plugged it here. One thing that it needs, one parameter it needs is username. So I'll pass in my username and basically it's a fetch response. It's a simple JavaScript fetch. So I just call a fetch and then these are some of the fields that, so remember this, this API is sending a lot of fields, right? 
maybe I don't need all of those fields. Maybe I just need a few one, few of those. So I'm just going to capture some of these fields and send it over to my uh, so this is actually a serverless function with Netlify. So I'm just going to send it over to my API. Now, I've got my I've got my function uh, all deployed on Netlify, uh, and then what I'm going to do here is I have an action here, and actions are how we can connect a downstream REST API with Hasura. So for ac for actions, this is the action that we're going to be working on. Articles is how we'll fetch dev.2 articles. So what I need to define here is an action definition. And this is, uh, this is in GraphQL format. But basically what it says is that I need a parameter of username, which is string. And then the response that I get back will be of type article response, which is what I described right here. So the fields that I'm interested is in is title, description, ID, and so on. And I deployed my I, de I deployed this function as a Netlify function, so it actually gives me a handy dandy URL that I can use. And all I did was copy that URL right here, so I have access to it right here. And then I'm just going to save this, and I'll check it out in Graphical. So I have articles right here, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get everything that I can to see if I can get this information from Dev.2. So um, I need to pass in a username. And the way to pass in a parameter is to say username. And you have to specify which type it is. So you specify string type. And then I'm just going to pass in a username here. And actually, my query variable is getting passed right here. So I'm passing in my username. And then when I run, it should go and fetch dev.2's articles from me. So it shows here that I published an article on September 20, which was just a test post and so on. So these are all the articles I get from Dev.2 API. Now let's say that the client has integrated with this and now they change their mind and they're like, okay, I don't care about Dev.2. I want actually GitHub repos. So in that case, what they can do is they can integrate with Dev.2 right here, which is also, they can integrate with GitHub, which is also a REST API, uh, which is also a REST API. So here we're going to pass in username again, just the same username and then hit play. And I get all the repositories that I have. So without re, for, for, the, uh, for the user, without reintegrating, they get access to two different APIs and they didn't have even had to like uh, read new documentation. So they have this access available to them. Now, both of these are uh, REST APIs. What if we want to add a GraphQL API? And actually adding a GraphQL API is really simple in Hasura because we have something called remote schemas available. Um, and let's walk through how we're gonna do that. So I'll click add. And basically here, I'm gonna say that my remote graph GraphQL's name is GraphQL uh, is GitHub. Um, and here I need the GraphQL server URL. So this is the same HTTP endpoint that you would do in a curl request. Um, and I have opened GitHub's documentation here. So let's go through this and see where we can find it. Um, there's a GraphQL overview and it talks about GraphQL schema reference. Maybe there is a guide somewhere. Check out the guides, uh, forming calls with GraphQL. So, okay, so let's see what this says. It says that to communicate with GraphQL server, you need an OAuth token. Okay, so that means that I need to pass in a header here. So I'm gonna pass authorization and then this needs a token. So I'll need to create one. I've actually done the background work of that and created it myself before. And I'm just gonna pass in this auth token here. And then it says you need an OAuth token and then it says, um, and then you, you can pass in uh, with you can call this API with this API endpoint and it's a GraphQL endpoint, so I'm just gonna copy that. And here, notice it says the endpoint remains constant no matter what operation you perform. So I'm just gonna copy this into my schema right here. So I've got my server URL hooked up. I'm sending authorization headers. I've got a token set up. And then I'll just click on add remote schema. Okay, looks like it's hooked up here. And let's see if I have access to this in Graphical. And if I go here, I have access to all of GraphQL, uh, GitHub's API right here. 
And this is really cool because as a client, I get access to this right away. And as an API developer, this was super easy to add a new API endpoint. Let's see if this actually works. So maybe I will look at the viewer, which should be me. And maybe I will find out um, maybe I'll find out my login and my name because I don't know. So it's it shows here that my login is Shruti Kapoor 08 and my name is Shruti Kapoor, which is great. And then maybe what we'll do is let's get a list of followers. So maybe we'll get 100 followers and we'll get uh, their bios and the company that they work at, their email, because why not spam them? and hit reply, hit send. And so let's see if we get some uh, followers here. So I've got, uh, actually didn't get their name, but anyways, we have their bios, we have their emails, so there we go. We can spam these people. So anyways, as you saw, this was so simple to add a new API, right? We, we added REST APIs, we added uh, GraphQL APIs, we added GraphQL APIs using remote schema by just having access to the GitHub a URL itself, the API endpoint, and we added actions, we added REST endpoints by creating a simple fetch um, and adding them as actions and deploying them as Netlify's headless functions, as a less functions. So that's basically how you add a new, um, that's basically how you can add a new endpoint as well. And these endpoints can be authenticated as well, or they can be uh, unauthenticated endpoints and Hasura doesn't really care about that. So to wrap up, the advantages of having a unified API is that it provides this abstraction layer where you can unify how each of those requests are made. And you don't need to worry about passing in these parameters to all of those downstream APIs because the platform will do it for you. Unified API will do it for you. And there is one API that the client will need to integrate. And because we're also using GraphQL for making our unified API, we can also get all of the advantages of GraphQL, which is that there is a constant version once the, uh, the client has integrated with one version or the endpoint, that's all they need. They can get all of the new updates available right away. They don't have to reintegrate. And as an API developer, it's really helpful because with GraphQL, you get a very powerful instrumentation on fields itself so you know which fields are being called how many times and when you publish a new uh, update that's available right away to all of the clients so to wrap up we talked about what is a unified api we talked about why unified api uh, we sh i showed an example of how to connect rest apis and graphql api and then we talked about some of the advantages of this that's all I have for you today, but I wanted to leave with one final dev joke. Thank you everybody so much. You have all been a great audience. Again, if you're interested in the slides or dev jokes, you can follow me on Twitter at Shruti Kapoor 8 If you have any questions, please feel free to DM it to me. Thank you so much, everyone.